So I'm going to be speaking about uh, the current state of the data sharing economy. I'm Srishtika Nilakantam and I work as a developer advocate for Ably Real Time. Any of you have heard of Ably before? Cool. So for the rest of you, um, Ably offers a real, um, you know, a real time messaging infrastructure as a service that you can implement in your applications to incorporate real time or live sort of functionality. Um, in my spare time, I also volunteer with the Mozilla Foundation and I'm a co-author of a Web VR book. And in this talk, we look at uh, the evolution in the communication protocols that have, um, that have enabled us to build the kind of applications or, uh, you know, build the kind of businesses around data that are really um, based on how much time the data takes to move from one point to the other and, uh, you know, the kind of applications that are completely data centric. So let's get started. Um, it all started in late 1980s and 90s when, um, you know, Sir Tim Berners-Lee came up with, invented the World Wide Web, enabling any two nodes to speak with each other over the internet, even though they were geographically, you know, miles apart. Now, um, obviously, uh, in, in college or in university, you would have heard of the OSI model. So let's actually begin from the basics. Bear with me if you com are a complete master of the things that I'm going to cover in the first few slides. But this is just to, like, you know, put some context um, for the rest of the discussion. So obviously, with the Open Systems Interconnect model or the OSI model, we have different layers which tell you how uh, your applications from the application layer in, uh, interact with physical uh, web that lets your data traverse around the internet and then communicate with other applications. The only thing, I'm not going to bore you with the explanation of the, all the uh, layers, but do you actually remember, when you studied this in university, did you actually remember this um, you know, OSI model? It was really difficult for me to remember. So our professor, networks professor in college, gave us actually a really good way to remember it. If you see the first uh, you know, letters of each of these layers, it sort of forms this, which further extends to, please do not trust salesperson's advice. Not really sure um, how many of you agree with that, but um, anyway, that's a good way to remember it. What we are interested to know in this uh, sort of OSI uh, model is only the seventh layer, which is the application model, which provides us with the network services for the applications that we build as JavaScript developers, and you know um, the services that enable our applications to communicate with the other uh, you know clients or nodes over the internet. So, um, you know the. As the, as the internet and, you know, this communication became popular, there needed to be some kind of set of rules, standard set of rules, that, uh, you know, all of these nodes participating in this internet had to adhere with. And uh, the most standardized, uh, you know, the standardized uh, communication protocol over the internet is HTTP, of course. We know about it, hypertext transfer protocol, and that's, that's where it resides in the layer 7, which is very near as to where we, uh, you know, work with the different kind of applications. So actually, let's have a quick look. I have a simple HTTP application, and if I show you the inspector tab, we've done this a lot of times for our applications to, you know, kind of debug the way our application is interacting with over the internet. So if I quickly refresh this, hopefully the internet is working. So this is the resource I've requested. And as you can see, you have you know the request URL that I've requested, the different methods. HTTP comes with you know get, put, post, all of those things which you're already aware of. The status code 200 generally means it is you know successful, and you can go in depth uh, in details about the different kinds of requests and uh, response headers that you have. You can also look at the timing, which gives you the you know basically latency from the time you send the request and the time you got the response. So if you think about it, basically HTTP works th uh, this way, right? You have a client and a server. Client sends a request. The server, depending on uh, you know if it has the resource or the service requested, gives back that resource in the response or just sends back an empty response or just an error. And then if the two entities want to communicate again, you set up a whole new connection and then the same request and response cycles repeat. Now HTTP is stateless, so you can't really have preserve the context from the previous communication. And if you want to you know, um, continuously communicate, this whole setup needs to be repeated all the time. So this is all well and good for the applications we had back in the day when you know there are some static hosted resources that you had to, uh, you know, look at. Uh, for instance, say there was a business that, um, that learned about the advent of internet and wanted to make their business more visible or accessible by placing their products or placing their catalog over the internet. 
um you could click on a button and you would send essentially in the back um, background you will be sending a request and getting some response back and that will be nicely displayed on the web page so at this point actually let's start put to uh, start putting together all of this that we're talking about on a linear graph so by the end of this talk we kind of know uh, where we are currently at this evolution of the, in the of the online data sharing economy right so as i said as internet came and you know there were standardized protocols and you had really good ways of you know communicating efficient ways of communicating over the internet businesses thought it would be a good idea to you know make their services available over the internet they built websites and let their users request resources and all kinds of data from those websites but then what happened this became really popular now this was really usable and really um, helpful for the users to like you know click a button from the comfort of their home and you know access all, access all this kind of data and resources right so as this happened the people or the businesses hosting the websites uh, quickly realized that they had to build more functionality on top of the basic implementation to deal with the kind of traffic that was coming to this website so you know they might be uh, they might have to deal with how many people are coming you know rate limiting some kind of you know ip addresses etc so that their servers basically don't crash and then obviously you uh, came up with a uh, caching mechanism because a lot of these people who are requesting some resources were requesting for the same kind of set of resources a lot of those people so you know you could just essentially put a caching mechanism in between and just duplicate the resources that were already requested without disturbing the server all the time even for duplicate resources then obviously all of these assets that you were showing were to be stored somewhere and you had the databases which were again connected to your server again communicating over http and all of that sort of thing came up and soon people realized this sort of engineering stack and the investment and time spent on engineering to just make a website and its services available online this sort of functionality stack was growing and growing as you know more people started using websites and people realized the possibilities that could be done now while all of this was happening a couple of other people were observing this trend and they said Hey wait a minute this is not just for the one website that we are discussing about every business that wanted to you know put their services online as an application or a website was facing the same issues and was trying to solve all of those functionality layers by implementing everything from scratch now as engineers we uh, kind of avoid reinventing the wheel all the time right so even with all the javascript frameworks we have we sort of have some kind of functionality built in that we can use on the fly that's exactly what uh, the people observing this trend thought why not implement these functional uh, implement this sort of functionality once and provide it as a service for any company that wants to use it and that's sort of when how the concept of cdn or content delivery network came about where they basically took all of this functionality and you know provided it as a service and not just this one website but any sort of you know business or application that wanted to use these services on top of their initial implementation could do that and they would be responsible for uh, you know managing all of this uh, all of these challenges and complexity um so this worked really well right because a lot of people then uh, could use these websites and the data that was available in the website without having to without the business and the businesses don't didn't have to worry about you know okay if there are so many people coming to my website maybe i should worry about abc rather than that now they can really worry about what their main focus is which is you know creating the data that they want to host on the website or creating uh, say if it is a merchandise store creating the merchandise that they actually will host on the website later on so um you know if we go back to the kind of applications that we were looking at um this is kind of as i said this sort of model worked really well for static applications or something that had to be computed on the fly but if you look at uh, the applications that we're using now we're more and more moving towards the event driven or real time kind of architecture right when something is happening in the real world we would like to know using by the use of the internet and the internet enables us to do that so why not do it so let's actually look at Uh, i mean if you think about http as a protocol uh, solution for this it doesn't really solve the problem right so let's actually consider a real world example where some data is changing all the time say bitcoin pricing which changes every few seconds so here i have a website which basically has uh, does a http request to 
a data provider that is providing the price of Bitcoin in terms of USD. I'm just requesting that whatever data was returned, I've displayed on the website. But now I just refreshed it before starting this talk. But by this time, it obviously would have, uh, you know, changed again. The, the best bet for me would be to refresh in essentially sending a new request and, you know, hoping for some new data to arrive. So uh, that's how you get it. But then obviously these, this data is changing all the time and you need to like, you know, uh, repeat this request and response cycles or um, all of this cycle all the time, which is not really efficient because it's stateless. You need to um, repeat all the header information and everything. So one thing though, which is an improvement over HTTP, uh, the repetition of HTTP request and response cycles, which is called polling by the way, uh, is long polling where you can essentially re uh, request a resource and then let the server wait for a little longer before it sends back the response, uh, hope, hoping that it actually has some data to return. What I mean is, over here, I'm requesting some data, but in reality, it may not have changed actually. So if I do another request, it's the same you know, price that is being showed. So what I'm doing here is just um, request and response cycles repetition for no reason because the response return is empty because the server doesn't have any new data to return. So with long polling, you can, you can uh, solve that bit of uh, complexity where you let the server uh, persist the connection for a little longer, waiting for that data to become available, and then it sends that data back in the response. Obviously, if the data is taking forever to load, it'll uh, come back with an empty response anyway. Now, obviously, even with long polling, um, the kind of applications that we are talking about, say, you know, HQ, uh, HQ style applications where you have the live quizzes, you know, location tracking that your Uber application does for you, or any kind of like live or real time kind of applications, long polling is still not the answer. You're still repeating request and response cycles all the time. And if when you're doing it at high frequency, you can considerably see the latency being added to your application. And most of these real time applications can only uh, you know, afford a couple of hundred milliseconds worth of delay. So this is only worsening the situation. So a new web standard, which which could, uh, you know, almost let the server somehow initiate the communication was required, some sort of maybe bi-directional consistent connection, uh, that kind of a protocol was required, enter WebSockets. So um, halfway through 2008, WebSockets emerged as an idea where which, you know, by 2011, may, most of the major browser vendors would support. But obviously, HTTP has been around as a standard since the time web came about, right? And if you're, if you're coming up with this new protocol suddenly, you can't really expect all of the entities that are communicating over the internet to support this new protocol. So how WebSockets works, uh, works is, initially it starts off as a HTTP request response cycle, so you're sure everyone knows what you're talking about. But the only difference being in the header information of the request, of the HTTP request, you include an upgrade header, which basically means that you're asking the other endpoint to upgrade the connection to WebSockets. And if the other endpoint is compliant with that protocol, the, uh, the communication would be upgraded to WebSockets, which means it opens up a full duplex and persistent connection. Full duplex meaning now you have both your endpoints. Uh, they're able to communicate with each other simultaneously in both the directions. So if you think about it, the Bitcoin example that we saw, the server was the entity that actually had access to the data that the client was interested in, but it had no way to initiate a communication. It had no way to tell the client, hey, I have the data that you need. It had to wait for the client to request for that data. Only then it could send that data as a response. But with this, it has basically, there's an open avenue and both of the endpoints can communicate with each other anytime they want. And also the connection is persistent, meaning it is kept, it is started and kept open for as long as the application is running, which could be even indefinite for, that, for some applications. So if we now look at uh, another example, which is the same Bitcoin pricing, but you, which implements WebSockets under the hood, and hopefully while I'm speaking, uh, the, the price in real life update, so you can actually see that change. Um, well, um, it's not... Anyway, so basically what's gonna, what, was, what is supposed to happen is if in real life the... Web so, uh, the uh, sorry, the Bitcoin pricing changes. Uh, it should reflect that in the web page without me needing to interact with it in any way whatsoever. I don't have to refresh, refresh the page. I don't have to, you know, do any sort of like async Ajax request within the page, etc. Um, anyway, so 
because WebSockets um, uh, is another communication protocol, application communication protocol, it resides uh, alongside HTTP on the application layer um, in the layer 7 itself. Now, WebSockets is not the only real-time protocol that you would be needing for sort of live or event-driven applications. There are a lot of other, uh, you know, protocols like you would have heard of MQTT, which is sort of a lightweight equivalent of WebSockets, but it is, um, because it is lightweight, it is really more suited for IoT devices or battery-constrained sensors, etc. There's also a concept of service and events where you have the server, uh, being able to communicate directly or push data directly to the clients, but it's not really bi-directional as opposed to WebSockets. So what, um, e even though you have uh, all these kinds of protocols available to be used, WebSockets really majorly covers the, uh, uh, you know, maximum number of use cases that come when you think about uh, the real-time uh, world or the real-time scenario. But which protocol that you as a developer would use to implement in your applications really depends on I mean, evidently, it depends on the kind of application you're building. If you're building something on IoT, you would want to use MQTT. If there's a graph that you want to show on a web page, which is updating in a live manner due to some data changing, you would use WebSocket. So it, it's all dependent on the use case that you have. So obviously, um, as uh, everyone before me has been mentioning as well, uh, we as developers do not want to build everything from scratch. And reinventing the wheel is really not useful. So unless you're wanting to know how WebSockets, uh, you're just like, you know, trying out WebSockets and wanting to know how this works from scratch and, you know, basically tr testing it out or trying it out, there's no point in implementing WebSockets from scratch. Your best bet if you want to, you know, um, add real-time functionality in your applications is you could spin up some open source servers and there are so many options available in different kinds of uh, languages, different frameworks, etc. that you could use. Socket.io is obviously one of the most popular ones and I'm, uh, a couple of you may have used, uh, used it as well. It is very convenient and easy to use in one of the hobby projects that you're building. But what happens when you have uh, you have implemented the basic web sockets or the real-time functionality and uh, now are wanting to put that application in production. There are a lot of different, uh, you know, functionality bits that are crucial for a live or a real-time application to work properly at scale, uh, which is not just solved by a basic WebSocket implementation. Let's look at it by going back to the, you know, evolution graph that we had. So websites then were using predominantly HTTP, they were working with REST, and CDN solved a lot of, you know, complexity bits and uh, we looked at that. But now, WebSo uh, uh, the websites or applications, mobile applications, any kind of uh, entities would like to be real time. So they're able to communicate with other entities over the internet in real time. So then they ask their engineering teams to build this real time infrastructure, which could be using one of the open source tools that I just showed. But then what happens with real time is you need to implement something called fan out, which is, you know, analogous to caching for rest. But it is really different because with caching, you have the data, you store it at some, uh, you know, intermediate point, and whenever someone's requesting for that data, you just give it from there without disturbing the server. But with real time, everything happens then and there within that millisecond, right? So, say I am a publisher and I'm publishing some data, and that's it. I shouldn't be worried about the number of people that are consuming that data. So it should be really like a decoupled sort of architecture when you think about real-time applications, and that's how it will essentially work um, without any failure. So fan out is basically when I publish, it is that particular, you know, in a couple of milliseconds, it is literally duplicated and fanned out to all of the subscribers or all of the people who want to consume that data. And then with that obviously comes the question of scalability. In real-time architecture, it's really, uh, you know, spike-based scalability. In one second, you may have no clients connected at all, no messages being consumed. In, say, the next couple of seconds, you may have like a thousand consumers or even a million consumers connecting and listening to your messages, consuming to your messages. So the, uh, the scale changes at such high speeds and you can't even afford any latency in changing the scale as well because then it will affect your whole real-time application, which is the whole point of building it, with the least um, latency, right? So that sort of becomes really complex to implement. Now, obviously, while all of this was happening in every company that wanted to, you know, incorporate real-time or live functionality was building these sort of functionality layers on top of their, uh, you know, initial architecture, some companies looked at it and said, 
it's the same thing that was happening with CDNs that's repeating, where we could just separate these functionality out and provide it as a service. So, uh, anyone, so uh, multiple companies can now use this service, um, the single implementation of all this functionality, so ev not everyone goes about building it from scratch. Now, that then came the concept of DSN, or Data Stream Network, which allowed you to do this. Uh, basically, um, data stream network is a fairly new concept, so if you want to like visualize this, uh, it's sort of something like an abstraction of a distributed systems network, because obviously you would need a distributed system to make sure there's the, scalab the kind of scalability that is required, that is available, and the kind of fault tolerance and you know smart rerouting of your data that you require for real-time applications to work in with minimal latency. Now, all of this distributed systems architecture in, in, is encapsulated and put into like the circle, which is called DSN, uh, to which all of your different endpoints, front-end applications, servers, database, anything can connect to in sort of a plug-and-play fashion, which are completely decoupled. So if my truck is connecting to share its location data, any of the other entities that are connecting, the truck is not affected by it. It's all uh, handled by the data stream network, and that's how you know you don't have to deal with all of the complexity by, uh, if you want to incorporate real-time in your applications. Now, uh, a lot of, um, I think majority of the real-time real applications uh, work with this particular messaging architecture called PubSub or Publish Subscribe that you would have heard of. Basically, what happens here is all of the data that is happening, that is you know moving across in a real-time application, is uh, is organized into logical units called channels or topics, and you have the concept of publishers who are generating the data and publishing data onto one or more of these channels, and subscribers who are consumers of this data and who may be uh, you know, attaching to one, of, one or more of these channels to consume that kind of data. And as I said, these publishers or subscribers are completely decoupled and they don't have to worry about any of the complexity that comes with real-time architecture. So let's ha actually have a look at how this happens in practice so we know, we understand it in a better way. If possibly, if your internet is working, you could maybe and if my internet is working, yes. So if you, if you have your mobile, app, uh, mobile phones and if your internet is working, you can go to that uh, URL and try and comment something just so we see what's going to happen with the kind of pub, pub sub architecture I've been talking about. It's go.ably.io slash comment. I'm going to wait for a couple of seconds. Great. Opera Winfury says Ryan can't code. Anyway, so what's happening here, if you see, is I've implemented, um, I've, I've used a data stream network. In this case, I'm, I've used Ably, uh, which is a data stream network provider as well, to uh, you know incorporate this live functionality where I'm connected to all of the people who are connected in real time. So as you can see here, I have a channel called Comments, and Basically, I have subscribed to that comments channel and displaying whatever is coming on that channel in this text box that I have. And the same thing I'm doing here, where whenever you uh, you know hit the post button, I'm attaching to the same channel and then publishing my data to that channel. So it, as you can see, in this particular application, the publisher and subscriber are both this application. But it's not necessary to be so. It can be completely like, you know, I, I can have one uh, application which is only subscribing. I can have one application which is only publishing, or both, however or whichever y way you like it. I really hope they have pasta for lunch. I like it too. Anyway, getting back to the presentation. One more way of uh, you know thinking about PubSub is kind of like uh, subscribing to magazines. You tell the subscriber or like the magazine provider once that you are interested in getting this magazine. Well, not this particular magazine, but maybe whatever magazine that you're interested in, and that is delivered to you as soon as it is available, as soon as a new issue is available, without you needing to go to the shop again and again, or you know asking the publisher or whoever gives the magazines again and again, right? So. Coming back to the evolution of the online data sharing economy, now this is the point where we are at currently, where we're able to communicate in real time and we're able to react to the changes that are happening in the real world. But while all of this was happening, as you can remember, a lot of the companies realized that the data that they were producing was really, really high value and they thought, why not, I mean, 
until now, until this point, they were really creating applications out of the data they had. And at one point, they decided, what if we programmatically shared our data with other programmers or companies so they could process it further and make some um, um, other amazing applications? And what's in it for me? Well, I'll charge for my data. And that's, that's the takeaway for me, right? And that, uh, with that came the advent of application programming interfaces or APIs where two d different developer teams or you know, companies could communicate or could share their data programmatically for it to be used further on in different kinds of applications. A good way to think of it is maybe a company which is you know, measuring the temperature data all the time. Until now, maybe they had, uh, you know, at until some point, they had a website which, when you opened, showed you the current temperature. But then what if some other company came and said, hey, you know what, your data is really nice and I would like to build an application for iPhone which shows people all kinds of like UI um, animations where you know if it is raining, it shows it as raining, etc. And I would like to do it, but I need your data and I can't really access it like an end user. And that's how you would have an API. And I'm sure like all of us have used APIs at some point, REST APIs that is. So if you go back to this, when people realized this, they obviously started building an API for the data that they were providing. But with However, it happens throughout the history, even with REST APIs, they soon started fa facing a lot of challenges. With REST APIs, analytics was important. You have to you know, really understand how each of these developer teams that were your clients now are utilizing your REST APIs. And because it is all programmatically done, you need to implement analytics programmatically as well. So you have different you know, numbers being generated automatically so you can have a look. Then you have, uh, you have to implement rate limiting because you can't have one developer team hogging off all of your resources and not letting other, other people or other developers to consume your API. So rate limiting is another important uh, you know, functionality to be implemented. Then there's access management. Obviously, you have all of this data, but you can't have all of your clients access the same set of data, right? You have different depth of uh, you know security that you can allow with the different you know according to the commercial agreements you have so all these sort of like functionality bits were again being implemented by these um, you know engineering teams on top but if you again take a step back and think about it all the company wanted to do was make their data available as rest apis so other developer teams can utilize that data to do anything with it so a couple of companies um, you know, realized this trend happening and they said, it's the same thing that has been happening. Let's do um, the same, let's I mean, provide the same solution that was before, which is to take off these layers of functionality, put them in a service, and they call this API management tools, which um, I'm sure a lot of us have would have used as well, which provide all of this functionality. And it's not just like these. Uh, these are just like example functionalities, which are really crucial. But any kind of functionality that you must require when you know providing a REST API, all of that is implemented once by a certain service provider, which is providing an API management tool. And then any number of companies can utilize that one implementation. So you don't have to, not everyone has to implement from scratch, right? Now. All of this, if you see, this is where we are currently at. Now, this is, I think, from CDNs to API management tools to DSN, this is, I think, the current state of the data sharing economy is. But if you think about it, if you look at the history, everyone kind of like follows through what has been happening, right? So obviously, we had DSN, which was real-time equivalent, sort of equivalent of CDNs. but there was a possibility now for the people generating real-time data to share that programmatically as well. So people could generate, um, you know, uh, can basically build applications on top of those streams. You have the concept of stream sharing, using which you can share streams of data. So basically, essentially, like real-time APIs or real-time streams as such. So then came real-time APIs. But then if you think about it, obviously, all those sorts of uh, you know, complexities came forward. Some of them were similar to REST APIs, but some of them uh, were really required a completely different kind of solution. So there is analytics to be implemented, which is the same as that rate limiting to be implemented, which is really same as REST API. But then there's the concept of adapters and protocol interoperability. With REST APIs, HTTP is predominantly pretty much the only protocol that anyone would be using, right? But with real-time APIs, as I said, there are so many protocols that may need to communicate with each other. Uh, a sensor working with MQTT may need to communicate with a website working with WebSockets. And all this has to happen with minimal latency in real time. 
and also you have different kind of uh, you know systems say i want to invoke an aws lambda function when some real life event happens so i want to i want that event trigger to trigger that function so you need to build adapters to plug into all of these different kinds of systems so this is really a complex challenge to solve and i think as a lot of people are a lot of businesses are realizing that they can provide their data as streams there at this point is when they are realizing you know all of these complexities come forward obviously a couple of companies are already observing this trend and they um, they are saying okay let's provide this as a functionality implement it once so uh, a lot of companies can you know work on it um, basically utilize this functionality together so they don't have to build everything from scratch i think that's sort of like this whole snapshot of where we were and where we are currently at but it it in no way says you know would http become obsolete because we have all these new protocols now no because these are all for different kinds of use cases for different kinds of applications that you're building and the way you want to share your data with the other endpoints over the internet if you think about the internet now it is uh, full of you know data points moving around all the time and if you look at the statistics this data is only supposed to increase enormously i think at this point we really need to understand the options that we have to share this data online with anyone else um interacting with it thank you very much <laughs>